Well, thanks, band. I don't know. I always imagined going to a church where when the youth band showed up, you didn't realize it until you stared at them for a while. It's like, there's no difference. What a great team. I just appreciate their youth and our youth ministry so much and what they're doing in music for sure. Well, we're going to spend a couple of weeks together and we're going to look at um, some of the passages in the book of Romans as we talk about new identity. And so this uh, kind of this two-part talk is really for those that maybe are wondering what does it actually look like to follow Jesus, or maybe you've made a, a recent commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and hopefully as we look at some passages together, you'll truly begin to understand what Christ has done for you through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. So let's just open in a word of prayer as we get started today. Heavenly Father, we just... We thank you as we come through this Easter season on Palm Sunday when we saw so many people making a commitment to you in baptism and then to celebrate um, what it meant for you um, to pay for our sin on the cross and then to, to come on Easter and, and just celebrate what does it mean to serve a risen Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, as we, as we look at your word today, would you just speak by your Holy Spirit into us and teach us what it means for us to be dead to sin and alive in you. So I pray that you would do a good work in us today. You do a fresh work. That we would walk out of this place transformed and different from when we walked in. We thank you what you're going to do through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not sure if you can relate or not, but when I was a kid... I, I found it hard to be good all the time. I'm not sure why. I, I considered myself a really good kid, actually, and I still do, and my mom's not here to talk about that, so she's probably going to watch on, on live stream later, but I won't, I won't Skype her in to argue with me. But I really thought I was a good kid. But you know, I had those moments. <laughs> I was thinking about this week uh, as I was talking to some people about, you know, when I was relating to some of the new generation who's kind of grown up without that experience that most of you had with me, which was those spankings that we just can't forget. One of those. I got some of those when I was a kid still. I'm, I'm that old. And, and I was remembering one of those instances. And, and the funny thing is when I look back on that, I don't feel any kind of... Uh, you know, resentment towards my parents or any kind of anger towards them for doing that to me. Uh, what I remember is that, you know, when I was, I was riding my skateboard in the basement, which is just probably not a good idea, right? And, uh, and I remember just in my new skateboard, I was so excited and I was just flying around the corners. We had long hallways of concrete and, and, uh, and then they put carpet down, but that thin carpet, so it was just as quick. It was awesome. And then I fell off, and my skateboard went flying in the air and went right into the wall and stuck. And uh, my parents came down, and, and, and they heard the crash, of course. And I actually didn't get a spanking then. They just said, you know what? That is a really bad idea. You know, don't do that. And actually, it was my mom who caught me, and she's got a good sense of humor, thankfully. And, uh, and so it was, it was about a hole, a couple, about a foot off the ground in the wall. And she didn't know how to fix it, but she was trying to cover me a little bit. So she actually drew a little Mickey's Den thing and, and made it as if the hole was supposed to be there and drew a little cartoon picture around it. So my dad wouldn't notice right away. And so she kind of covered me, but she said, you know what, like, you just can't do this anymore. Do not ride your skateboard. I won't cover you again. And uh, you know what, the next day, it was such a nice day, and I saw my skateboard there. And I was deciding, you know what, it surely won't happen again. So I started taking off and going up and down the hallways, and you wouldn't believe it, but the exact same thing happened. I fell and shot the skateboard in the air, and right on that opposite side of the door, it stuck into the wall on the other side. And that is when I got the spanking that I, I cannot really forget. Because I knew, and the funny thing is, just because I knew better, you know, it didn't actually stop me from being better, you know. I still just had something in me that, in fact, even when I knew I shouldn't do something, it almost stirred a little bit in me that I wanted to do it all the more. Have you ever been told something like that? Remember when you were a kid or even as an adult, 
that you can't do something, and the very moment that you hear that, something inside of you says, really? But it looks fun. And then the more you think about it, the more you long about it, all of a sudden you find yourself doing the very thing that you were told you couldn't do or shouldn't do. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about this whole concept of what sin is and where does it come from. And we're going to look at Paul in the book of Romans. Some people go through the book of Romans and it seems very frustrating and complex, and it, and it kind of is. And so we want to look at a couple passages of Scripture, and what I want to do in the next couple of weeks is basically help you understand a little bit about what Paul is actually saying is true about us. And there's going to be probably some moments when you're going to push back and say, I think he's wrong, but I want you to set that aside and say, what if he's right? And what is he trying to get at? So it's going to be kind of high level skimming a lot of verses today. But I want to drive home a couple um, very important points that if you understand what Paul believes about our relationship with God, that reading the rest of it. And so I really want to kind of entice you to read Romans, to get into it. And I want you to understand a couple principles that would help you make sense of some of the the, the complex things that he talks about. Because he's a little ADD like me, so I get along with him. There's moments all of a sudden he's talking about something back there, and then he moves over here and back and forth. So I have no problem following him. Um, But if you do, this this will help you. But if you're like me, you probably all would say, you know what, there's something inside of us from the time we're born. Because we never have to tell kids how to do something wrong. From the very moment they're born, It seems as parents or grandparents, our whole job is trying to get them to behave. Which means if we didn't, they would go crazy. So we never say to a two-year-old, this is how you throw a temper tantrum. Let me show you. If you ever want a toy or candy when we're in the store, just stamp your feet, squeal, throw yourself on the ground you know, scream at your parents, I want it, I want it, I want it. We don't ever tell them that. I didn't ever tell my kids how to aggravate each other in the car, how to make each other mad. I never had to tell my kids how to be disrespectful when they got home to their mother. I never had to teach them how to do the wrong things. That was natural. In fact, I think it is easier for us to train a dog than to train ourselves or kids. I really do. And I think today, if we understand why Paul says what he does, if you can relate to that at all, when you were a kid or you've had grandkids or you got kids, how hard it is to get someone to behave. Even if you tell them clearly, plainly, like my mom did, you can't do this again or this will happen. It actually doesn't help. There's something inside of us, Paul would say. There's something in our basic nature that is marred, that is flawed, that needs to be changed. And scripture calls this thing sin. And so maybe you're here today and you're like, well, I don't even agree with the concept of sin, but that's okay for now. Let's just talk about it. Do you agree in principle that there is something inside of us that even when we want to do what is right, we just don't do it all the time? At least sometimes we do. I mean, sometimes for sure we do good things, but have you ever been angry at your spouse or your kids and then you say to yourself, I don't want to do that again? Have you ever found yourself doing it again at some point? Or do you ever just say, I'm never going to do that again, and just never, ever make a mistake again? Why is that not possible for us? Because there's something inside of us. Jesus said, and it's recorded in the Gospel of Mark, it's from within inside of us comes sin. It's not actually the external stuff we blame. It's not because she did this, I did that. It's not because they poked me, I poked back. It's not because they took my toy, I took their toy. Jesus says there's something inside us from within a man's heart, from within a woman's heart, there is evil thoughts. There's sexual immorality. There's there's theft and murder and adultery and malice and deceit and lewdness and envy and slander and arrogance. 
all of these evil things Jesus said actually comes from within us. Inside of us. Something is wrong with us. We're marred. And so I want to look at Romans. I'm going to go to Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. It's actually your memory verse that I want you to think about and I want you to meditate on. Not just the first verse. I want you to get two of them. Otherwise, you're going to walk away really depressed because the first verse says, For everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's the bad news today. The good news that Paul says in the next verse is, yet God, with undeserved kindness, in other words, not because you did anything good, not because you did anything right, he declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sin. So you might say, wait a second, Paul, you're saying that all have sinned. I'm not, I'm not convinced. You don't know me, Paul. How can you know me? You were, you were born a long time ago. A couple thousand years ago, Paul. I'm a good person. I do good things. Here's the thing that's undergirding what Paul is going to say later and says throughout his entire book in the book of Romans that he wrote to the Roman church. It's actually not just because you sinned that you're a sinner. Paul plays with this sinner concept in two ways. One way is that, yes, you do things wrong. In fact, he starts his, uh, his, his book here to the Romans, his letter to the Romans, by saying, we're all marred, we're all flawed, we all fall short, all of us sin. And he talks about all these horrible kinds of sins that man, mankind does. And then he says, by the way, if you're pointing the finger at other people and think, yeah, you're right, Paul, that's what those people do. He says, don't be fooled, you are just like them. He says, all of us have sinned. In our DNA, not only do we act out in sinful ways, but Paul is getting at something deeper, that inside all of us, we are born as a sinner. That's why we don't need to teach our children or our grandkids or even ourselves how to sin because inside of us when we're born we're born into the human race which is marred from the beginning the start from Adam's disobedience with God Paul would say I am a sinner and you are a sinner I don't need to know what you've done I don't need to know what you haven't done. Our condition is that of a sinner. I can't fix it. Even when I try, Paul says, I still end up doing the things that I don't want to do. And then when I try to not do some things, it's like those are the things I end up doing. What is wrong with us? Well, Jesus talked about this too when he met the man named Nicodemus, right? And Nicodemus said, how do I get life? How do I get a relationship with God? And Jesus said this, unless you are completely born again. That's where we get that phrase and you wonder, where do you say a born again Christian? Jesus says, unless you were born into a different family, a different inheritance, into unless something fundamentally has changed about your nature at the core of who you are, unless you've been born all over again, there is no way to get life. You must be reborn into a different line, into a different family tree. Seems a little crazy. In Romans chapter 5, Paul explains it a bit. He says this, You see, when Adam sinned, sin entered into the world, and Adam's sin brought death, and it spread like a disease in the DNA of everyone who followed Adam. It spread into everyone, for everyone then sinned. 
And what he's saying here, and it's kind of hard to understand, is that in the moment that Adam sinned, it's like everyone that ever came after him sinned in the same moment. They all sinned. We all sinned alongside of Adam. Adam's name literally means humanity or human. And so as the first human sinned, it tainted all of us. And we all became separated from God. And we all started owning the consequence of sin, which is death. So in the garden, when God said to Adam, if you eat of this, Adam, humanity, you will experience death. We think, oh, what, but Adam didn't fall over and die? No, but death entered in with sin. Whenever sin is present, death is present. You say, well, that's not fair. I wasn't there with Adam. I maybe would have encouraged him not to eat that. Well, the Bible says, don't be so deceived. If you think that you've never sinned, then you're really just fooling yourself. It doesn't take a genius to look back over your life and know there's been moments of time in which you purposely did things you knew that were wrong. It's not fair, though. Yes, well, it's not fair that babies are being born around the world addicted to crack. They did nothing wrong. But there's entire organizations that simply are put in place to hold and care for babies when they're born that are addicted to drugs, no fault of their own. There's kids all over a community that are suffering with fetal alcohol syndrome, nothing to do with themselves, but their parents chose to live a lifestyle that impacted them for their entire lives. No, it is not fair, maybe, that we were dramatically marred and impacted by Adam's sin, but not being fair does not make it not true, Paul would say. And so this undergirds everything Paul says is you have to understand that we are born, we have sinned in the sense that we have to own all of our sin together. We live in a world today where we believe dramatically that it's all up to us, that if I do a good job and I work hard, it's all the industrial revolution stuff that's come into our Western culture, that we're all individuals. I only pay for my own stuff. I'm only responsible for my own self. But God is way more communal than that. All throughout the Old Testament, God deals with the entire community even when one person sins. It's a different perspective and maybe it's not yours, but that doesn't make it true. So he goes on in chapter five and he says, yes, People sinned. In other words, I want to back up for a second because he's talking to the Roman church, right? And the Roman church, they didn't follow us the Jewish laws and so they would push back on him right off the bat and say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Sin is about rules. Sin is about the law. Sin is about the Jewish law. We don't even adhere to that. Paul, how can you say we've sinned? We didn't know anything. We didn't follow this. We didn't know the rules. We didn't know what God expected. How can you say, so maybe you're here today and say, you're saying I've sinned. I don't even adhere to this. I don't even agree with you. How can you say I'm a sinner? How can you say I've sinned? Well, this is what Paul was talking to, to the Roman people. They were like, hold the phone here. We're not on board with you. We're not even a part of this. And so he says, okay, here's what you have to understand. Yes, you have to get this, that people sinned even before the law was given. But it was still not even counted as sin necessarily, as in what they did, but in who they are, they were sinners. Because there was not any law to break didn't make them not a sinner. It meant they hadn't sinned or broke the law. Still, he says, the truth is, if you look around you, everyone still died. So his argument is, even if you don't agree about sin, You have to look around and say, the Bible is saying, and Paul is saying, and God is saying that death is part of sin. And so if you see people dying around you, and we are all going to die, and we are all dying, then sin has a role at work. 
sin is alive and well because everyone still died, even before the law was given. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, before anything was ever said, thou shalt not, people died because of the consequences of sin, even though they didn't know what not to do or what to do. Even those who did not disobey even an explicit command of God, as Adam did, still died. They still suffered the consequences of sin. Sin isn't just about what you do, Paul says. Sin isn't just about what you don't do right. Sin is part of who our nature is as we're born into Adam. And therefore, you can argue whether or not you've personally sinned till you're blue in the face. But Paul would say, because you experience death around you, God says, that came because of your sin. So he continues on. So he says, well, in Adam is a symbol or a representation of Christ who was yet to come. And there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. So death comes in, and it, some of just say the way it should be translated, it's everyone. Death came into everyone because of Adam. But even greater is God's grace. His wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Paul says, you remember how Jesus said you need to be born again? Adam was born of God, right? He came in without any sin. And in his disobedience, in his rebellion towards God, Sin started to spread to everybody. It was part of every heir of Adam was born with a sinful nature. A foreshadow of Jesus who has come, born of God. A virgin Mary, why is that important? Because here is the second Adam, the second man that comes on the scene, that it comes directly from God, that is not marred with sin nature, that is not marred with his own sin, is able to come in, and in his obedience, he is able to do something that Adam or any of us could not do, which was to be righteous in God's sight. But in Jesus' obedience, and in his obedience to the cross, giving, granting forgiveness and grace to all of us, life is able to come. We are able to be born again. We can be grafted into a new family tree in Christ. And the sin and the punishment of sin, the results of sin, which is death, were taken by Jesus Christ on the cross. And now we can be in Christ, in a new family, having a new nature and a new destiny, not one of sin, not one of death, not one of now separation with God, but a destiny of conquering over sin, being alive in Christ, and not being separated from God, but being in relationship with him forever. A new family tree. So he goes on and he says in verse 16, so the result, the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, that we would be condemned. But God's free gift leads to our now being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. The good news in this, he's saying the good news, if you've ever heard that phrase saying this, you can choose your friends, but you're kind of stuck with your family. We've all heard that. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Paul's saying, guess what? There's a new day. You can choose your family. You can choose to be grafted and brought and adopted into a new life a new bloodline, a family that has conquered sin, a family that is no longer marred by sin, 
the descendant of Jesus Christ who conquered death and brings life. We now can choose. So verse 17, he goes on and he says this. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin. Why? Because we're going to be triumphant over sin? No, because now we are born of Christ. We are born, we are alive in him, and he has triumphed over sin. And so now we will live also in him. We now get to live in triumph over sin. And death, triumph over death. That's why the resurrection again is so important. Jesus conquered death. And so in him, we no longer get to face that anymore. We get to be alive we get to live forever. Even though, Paul says later on, even though this body will die, we will live. We will not face death. We will no longer in Christ face eternal separation from the Father. We inherit Jesus Christ's obedience when we align ourselves with his family tree. Well, let's look at how we do that then. How do I get this? How do I become a part of this new family? What do I need to do? How do I get this life? And this is what the people around him, as Jesus talked about life and getting life, because the law brought death. Every time there was more rules, people just realized how far they fell short, how much they couldn't do anything right. It didn't matter how clear it was. It didn't matter how much they were told, do not do this. They, like you and I, would immediately long and think about what not to do and end up doing it. And so Paul would say the law did not bring about life. It actually increased a feeling of death. But I can now accept Jesus' death as my death. I am under sin. I am a sinner in my nature. But when I decide to align myself with Jesus Christ in his death, his death becomes my death. Romans 6 says, For we know that our old self then was crucified with him so that the body of sin within us, the body, our nature of sin within us, that internal nature to do wrong, the internal nature has been born on us, that nature, that body of sin would be done away with on the cross that we would no longer be slaves to sin. No longer would we have to say yes to sin. But we die alongside with Christ. That's the first thing. I have to accept that he died because, not because of just the things I did, which is true. He died because of the things I did, but he had to die because the sentence on my head was I had to die because I am a sinner. I am inheriting the death sentence from the time I was born. When I align myself with him and I accept the fact that he said, I will die in your place, Sean. Then I inherit his death on my behalf. And then the exciting part is, then I accept then Jesus' life as my life. As he resurrected, as he rose again, we died with him, but then we also were brought to life in him. And so he says in Romans, uh, sorry, in Colossians 2, Paul says in another letter, it says, when you were dead in your sins, in your sinful nature, then you were dead, God made you alive with Christ. And he forgave all of our sins. We witnessed baptism a couple weeks ago. Paul refers to it as a powerful imagery of what this means and why it's so important that we see this often, why it's so important that we take this step of faith. We say to ourselves, you know, what does this mean? If, if God's so gracious and people were asking Paul, so does that mean we just keep sinning? Do we just keep living the way we used to live? I don't know, we just accept it? Do we just accept what Jesus Christ did for us and then we just move on? We just keep doing our normal life? Is that what we do? Paul says, are you kidding? Did you forget something? 
Don't you remember? Don't you remember back when you were baptized? Do you remember when you identified yourself with Christ in baptism? Do you remember what that meant? It meant that you were going into the grave, that you were dying with Christ. That's why it's important that you take that step. So when you forget, when you keep on sinning, when you keep walking that way, sometimes we teach this. Well, if you keep sinning then, that must mean that you're not really Christian. You probably can hear sermons on that on a regular basis if you like. So if I keep sinning, some people say, well, that must mean you're not a Christian. Or if you keep sinning after you become a a Christian, I guess that just means you're going to end up in hell. And you can hear sermons all over the place on that too. But I do not think that's what Paul is saying. He's saying if you keep on sinning after you accepted Christ, you need to remember. You need to know something that is true. Did you forget something? You keep sinning, you've gone back to an old way of life. He would say to you, you're not, it's not that you're going to go to hell. It's not that you didn't really mean it. He says, you forgot. You forgot when you accepted what Christ did for you in your baptism. It meant that you died, and now you were alive in Christ. You were buried with him through baptism into death in order that. Why did you go down? Why did you get baptized? Because of this that Christ was raised from the dead, and so in the baptism then, you now identified with living a new life. Don't forget. It's why the step of baptism is so important. Because when you get tripped up, he says you need to remember. You need to remember the truth. The truth is, the body of sin has been dealt with. You are alive in a new life. The mistake that we make is that many of us, we come to Christ sometimes in hopes that he does just make us a better person. And Pastor Dan was just talking about this on Easter. Make you a better dad, and he will. You know, you follow Jesus, you'll be a better dad. You'll be a better husband if you follow the principles that Jesus taught. You'll be a better coworker. You'll be a better neighbor. You'll be all kinds of better, really. If you, just, if you did not accept his death on your behalf, if you just said, you know what, I just like Christianity. It's, it seems to work for me. You're right. You know what? You can take the principles that Jesus taught, and I believe strongly life will work for you. It will. But that does not bring about new life. There is something fundamentally wrong with us in our nature that needs to be changed. We need to die. And we need to be reborn and brought into a new family tree so we can inherit everything that Jesus accomplished on the cross and in the resurrection. We need that or we will face our own death for our own sin. This is fundamental to everything that Paul is teaching. Jesus said, unless a kernel falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bring about life. We have a choice. We can die for our own sin. And we can be held accountable for being our nature of sin. And one we we can be separated from God for eternity. We can face our own physical death, our emotional death, and our spiritual death. Or, Paul is saying, you can align yourself in baptism. You can align yourself in a commitment with Jesus Christ. And you can say, Jesus, you already died. Why would I pay for my own sin when you paid for it on the cross? I accept that. And I will live a new life with you. I want to be part of your family. I need a change. I need life. Sean doesn't need a better version of Sean. I don't need to be Sean 2.0. I need to be Christ in me. Or there is no eternal change. I can be better by following the principles that Jesus taught, but I will still have to pay for my own sin. Or I can say, Jesus, thank you for paying for my sin. I now accept new life from you.
One more passage as we close. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. When we unite ourselves with him in death, when we accept in our nature we need to be changed that we cannot be better, we will also be raised to life as he was. And we know then that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer then slaves to this sin nature. It is dead. It is gone. In Christ, that nature that says, do what's wrong, that nature that normally bubbles up and leads us to wrong, in Christ, that nature is dead. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You might say to me, you know what, Sean, that sounds great, but I've been doing this church thing a long time, been doing the Jesus thing a long time, and sin is alive and well in me. You might say that, and guess what? We're going to talk about that next week. How's that for a trailer? I can't, I can't deal with that all today. And I really would like you to come back next week. Because I know that in all of us, I know in me there's times that I say, man, I, this sound, Paul, this sounds so good to be true. I did the baptism thing. I, you know, I, I pray and pray, and I asked my, my son the other day, you know, tell me about when you accepted Christ. He says, oh, like, which time? <laughs> I said, yeah, I've been there. And, you know, he's like, oh, I've done it, like, I don't know, like, every, every couple of weeks. <laughs> so I was like, okay, when do you think that you felt it? You know, oh, yeah, I can, you can tell me that. But I said, I've been there. You've been there, right? Man, that must not have worked. <laughs> I'll try that again. And some of you are like, I gotta get baptized all over again. I did that, but I just, pff, I walked away and it seems like sin is alive. We gotta talk about that and we'll talk about that next week, okay? I wanna end with this verse and I want you to memorize this verse. In fact, I want you to just know this verse inside and out for a week, okay? So if all of this is true, if you're in Christ today, if you've accepted Christ, if you've taken the step of obedience, if you've unified yourself with Christ, if you've lined yourself with Christ, Paul would say this then. So then, you should consider. Not consider is, a, is not even a great translation. He'd say count it, count on it would be a heavier. Count on it, depend on it, trust in it. Consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and now alive to God through Christ Jesus. If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ, if you accept his death on your behalf and you say, I live a new life through him, then I want you to focus on this week. I want you to tell yourself and remind yourself over and over again, I am dead to sin. Sin is not my master. Sin is, has no power over me. I am new. I have a new nature. I have new DNA. I'm in a new family line. I am not under condemnation. I am no longer held accountable for my sins. I am now alive. Everything that Christ did has now been given to me. I inherit it all. Christ was not conquered by sin. He conquered sin. Therefore, I am in Christ. Therefore, I am not defeated by sin. I am a conqueror over sin. Paul is kind of hard to understand. If I was to sum it up, I would say he wants to say this over and over again. Basically is this. I am not who I think I am sometimes. I'm not who I think I am. Sometimes I think I'm just, sometimes I think I'm poor, you know, because I drive with other people with really nice cars. Sometimes I go to people's houses and I have coffee and I look around and go, man, I am not doing well. Sometimes I don't think something. That does not make it true. The truth is I am in the top probably two or one percent of the world in being wealthy. But sometimes I don't think I am. But that does not change reality, does it? Paul says, you know what? You're not just who you think you are. And you know what? I am not who you think I am. And so you may look at my life sometimes and you might think, my goodness, you're a mess. And someone might say to you, you're a mess. But you know what? It doesn't matter what someone says about you. It matters what? It matters who God says that I am. 
We're not talking about positive thinking. You'd think Paul's saying, this is positive thinking. This is like psychology stuff. You just want us to go meditate and repeat over and over again. I am dead to sin, dead to sin, alive to God. Alive to God, dead to sin, positive thinking. I've done this before. No, positive thinking does not work if something is not true. I can fly, I can fly, I can fly. No, I can't. I cannot fly. (laughs) Paul is not pitching positive thinking. He is saying that you are being tripped up, you are being lied to by the world around you, you're being lied to by yourself, you're being lied to by others, but what God says about you is true, and so you better consider it, you better count it, you better memorize it, you better meditate on it. You are dead to sin and alive to God. And every time you trip up, he says, don't forget, you forgot again. You forgot, didn't you? Don't you remember? You are dead to sin, and you're alive to God. We get to have some baptisms after the 11 o'clock service. If you want to see that, you haven't seen it before, or you want to just watch it, I mean, we're not having it after this service, but after 11 o'clock, we had people on Easter that said, I want to be dead to sin and alive to Jesus. And they're going to come, and they want to be baptized. And so we're going to do it at 11 o'clock service. You want to come back? You want to go have coffee in the cafe and hang out and do this all over again? More than welcome to. Probably be a completely different service next sermon, next service, so that's okay. But we're going to do that. It's one of the most exciting things we get to witness is someone experiencing life dead to their nature and becoming alive and becoming a whole new person. If that is something that you're saying today, man, that is, I, I just didn't understand it like that before. I didn't realize how bad it was. See, it is, it's worse. The, the good news is really good when you realize how bad it is. Jesus didn't really just die because you made up a couple mistakes. He had to die because you had a death sentence on you. And he took your place so that you could have life. And if you want to experience life today and you haven't done that, you can come forward. We're going to have the worship band come out and they're going to play a song and you can come up and you can pray after the service. You can talk to one of our prayer team. And if you, I, I can do this. I, I don't have permission to, but... It's what Dan says when you got the mic. You know what? And you, if, if you want to be baptized at the 11 o'clock service, I don't think Dan will say no. But come up here and let's have a talk. Let's figure this out. And let's find life. Let us close. Heavenly Father, sometimes it's hard for us to see ourselves in our true identity. And sometimes it's harsh to understand that in our true nature, when we were born in this world, we were, we were enemies of you just by, by our line, by our family tree, that we own the consequences of sin. And in, in follow suit, we sinned right along with Adam. Heavenly Father, I thank you. You did something that no one else could do. You came into this world without sin, to create a whole new bloodline, a whole new family race, one that would not be separated from you, one that would not be under condemnation, one that would have life instead of death. Heavenly Father, help us understand that today we simply just need to trust in you, that you died in our place, and we can live in this new life today, starting the life today for all of eternity. For those that don't know you, Heavenly Father, would you just show them how you've loved them since the beginning of time and made plans and provision to bring them to life. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.